In this video, let f of x equal the square root of x plus 1, and we're going to find the Taylor polynomial, the fourth degree Taylor polynomial of this function centered at 0. So we're going to grab the first couple terms of its Maclaurin series, and we want to use this to approximate the value, the square root of 0 0.9. So notice, making a connection to the function right here, that point 9 is really just 1 minus 0.1, which is our function evaluated at negative 0.1. So that's going to be the connection we want to make there. And so using the Taylor polynomial, we see, we're see we going to see that f of negative 0.1 is approximately the same thing as t4 of negative 0.1. We'll make that estimate, and then we'll see how good that estimate's going to be. Uh, now, before getting into the, into the details of the calculation, let's look at the graphs of these things for a little bit. Uh, so in all three of these graphs, the yellow curve right here will be our function y equals the square root of 1 plus x. Uh, this first reddish function, it's magenta, uh, is our tangent line. It'll be, it'll be the line at the point 1 comma, sorry, 0 comma 1. Like so, this is the linear approximation. You now see here in cyan, this bluish color, uh, this is our tangent parabola. Uh, which is doing a little bit better than the tangent line. Then in the next graph over here, you see this, the degree three Taylor polynomial. It's a cubic graph. Uh, it fits the curve even better. And then finally, this violet graph you see in the third one, it is going to be the degree four Taylor polynomial, which we're going to look for in just a second. And so graphically, you can see this thing does pretty good. Now, of course, you're going to be really good near the point of tangency. Now, the farther you get away, the worse it does, but it does pretty good inside of these green lines right here. So where did these green lines come from? Now, one thing I want to mention is that this function f of x right here, uh, it could be written as 1 plus x to the 1 half power. And this helps us recognize that this is, in fact, a binomial series, a binomial series for which k equals 1 half. Now, for this binomial series, we can then very quickly see that the radius of convergence is 1. That is, our x value needs to sit between negative 1 and 1, the, our interval of convergence. The function will equal its Maclaurin series when x is between negative 1 and 1. Outside of that, the, the Maclaurin series diverges, and therefore equality is not possible. So notice that between the values x equals negative 1 and x equals 1, the fit between the function and the Taylor polynomial are, is really, really tight. But outside of that, you don't get any... Uh, you don't expect anything to happen here because only between negative 1 and 1 is the, is the function equal to its Maclaurin series. And therefore, only between negative 1 and 1 would we expect the Taylor polynomials to approximate uh, this function. So we see, we see that in this picture here. So like I said, our function is a binomial series. Therefore, f of x, which again equals 1 plus x, to the one half power, we can very quickly get its Maclaurin series where n equals zero to infinity. You're gonna get one half, choose n, times x to the n. You get this thing very, very, very quickly. And so remember this binomial coefficient has the following properties, that if you take k choose zero, you're always gonna equal one. If you take k choose one, it's always equal to k. And then more generally, if you're taking k choose n, this thing will look like k times k minus 1 times k minus 2. And so you'll then continue on until you end up with k minus n minus 1 like this. Although these last few bits are typically written as k minus n plus 1. And this all sits on top of n factorial. All right. And so we're going to use this formula in the consideration for the above. Uh, now, we don't have to do all of the series. We just want the Taylor approximation degree four. So we are going to say that this is approximately the same thing as t4 of x. And so we just have to grab the first couple coefficients. So like I said before, k0 is always one. So you're going to get one plus k choose one is always k. So you're going to get one half x. For the next ones, we need a little bit more to it perhaps. So you're going to get k, which is one half times k minus one, which is actually negative one half over two factorial x squared. Uh, the next term will be 1 half, negative 1 half, and then you're going to take the negative 1 half and subtract another 1 from it, negative 3 halves. This will sit above 3 factorial times by x cubed. And then finally, you're going to get a 1 half times a negative 1 half times a negative 3 halves times uh, 
a negative five halves right there, and then this sits above four factorial. Don't forget your x to the fourth right there. Now let's try to simplify these things. The first couple of coefficients we already did, of course. Uh, so you get one plus one half x. For the next one, you do see there's a negative sign, and so you'll get a negative right here. Uh, for the next one, so if you track all the twos, you have a two, you have a two. Two factorial is itself just a two. So this is gonna be one eighth, negative one eighth times x squared as the next term there. Um, for three factorial, notice three factorial is three times two times one. Um, the three on the bottom does cancel with the three on top. You have two negatives, which double negative actually makes it a positive. And then if you grab all the twos, we have a two, two, two on top, that's an eighth. There's a two on the bottom, that's gonna give us a 16th. So we get one pos or positive one sixteenth x cubed. And then finally, if you look at the last one, again, the uh, four factorial becomes one times two times three times four. Uh, the threes will cancel right here. Uh, you have a negative, 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 so it's actually a, a net negative, like so. And if we keep track of all the twos, you have a two, 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 two. So there's four twos on the top. Uh, I should say four one-halves on the top. That's going to give us a one-sixteenth. And then you have a two and a four. That's an eight. So 16 combi combined with the eight that's in the denominator already, you're going to end up with one twenty-eighth, or I should say 28, 128 on the bottom. And then the only other coefficient on the top that didn't we haven't interacted with is the five. So you're gonna get five over 128 x to the fourth. And so this is our this is our Taylor polynomial approximation of the function. So like we said earlier, the square root of 0.9 is a this is equal to f of negative 0.1, which will be approximately the same thing as t4 of negative 0.1. And so we have to shove this into the function above and all these different places for x. So we end up with one plus uh, negative 0.1 over uh, two, sorry. We're gonna get a minus negative 0.1 squared over eight. And then we're going to get a positive negative 1.1 cubed over 16, and then finally minus, minus five times negative 0.1 to the fourth over 128, like so, all right? And so again, there's, there's some tedious arithmetic that needs to go on here, but in the end, this thing would approximately become 0 0.9486828. Six nine four. If I did all those correctly, so you get your estimate right here. That's good. That's good. What are we going to do next? So the next thing is we have to estimate how good this thing is going to be. Which, when you look at this thing, um, notice. Well, how are we going to how are we going to estimate this thing? Well, since we since we estimated this thing using the Taylor polynomial, we're going to use Taylor's inequality to help us compute the possible error, sort of worst case error, error here. And so the thing to remember with Taylor's inequality is the error is gonna be bounded above by m times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus first all over n plus one factorial. And this is gonna happen for all x's which are sufficiently close to a, that is the distance between x and a is d. And also remember that m is an upper bound for the n plus first derivative of the function on this interval as well. So what is the n plus first derivative here? Now remember, we our series we were using, we got about from the binomial series. So we kind of skipped all the, the derivative steps, step by step by step. And if you want to see those, you can actually look in the lecture notes that are linked in the description of this video for a full detail here. But as it's a binomial series, the derivatives follow a basic pattern. We don't have to compute them step by step by step. The nth derivative of this binomial series, or that is the, the nth derivative here is gonna look like k choose n times one plus x raised to the k minus n power. K minus n. That's the pattern we got. And so when we plug in x equals zero in the center of this Maclaurin series, we end up with, uh, I'm sorry, I got, let me let me back that up. No, well, this what we have here is fine. 
Uh, but this should be over in factorial, excuse me. So the nth derivative over in factorial is gonna equal this expression right here. This is the pattern we get when you do those derivatives after derivatives after derivatives after derivatives. So therefore, if we choose n to equal four, we then have to look at the next piece going on here, right? And so the next piece to help us find this m value right here, m has to be bigger than the nth derivative. Um, but then if we slap this n plus, uh, if we slap this thing on the bottom right here, right? We see that m over n plus one factorial, it needs to be greater than or equal to this k choose n times one plus x to the k, the k minus n power there. And so let's put in the specifics for our function so we're gonna get one half, choose n, uh, sorry, n plus one, that's what I meant to put in there, n plus one. And then this one plus x, uh, we're gonna raise that to, I guess we, I guess I, I, I don't have to be so, so general here. The n is a four, right? So all of these should just be five. So let me kind of back up there and fix this. So m over five factorial, this needs to be bigger than the this is gonna be bigger than one half choose five times one plus X raised to the one half minus five right there. So with that in mind, M is gonna be this value. Well, I guess we can just leave M over M over 120 here is, we'll, we'll just move to this side. M is gonna be very equal to 120. Then we would do this one half choose five, like we saw before, uh, we're gonna get one half times negative one half times negative three halves times negative five halves and then one more you should have five factors on the top you're going to get negative seven halves right there and this will all sit above the five factorial right so you see that those ones are going to cancel out and so then what do we have now we're going to have one plus x raised to the negative nine halves power, like so. And so how how bad can this thing get uh, in this in this interval in question? Uh, let's try to clean this thing up a little bit because we again, we're, we're taking absolute values of all these things. So all the negative signs don't really matter. If we keep track of the twos, you get one, two, three, four, five twos. So you're gonna get a 32 on the bottom, in which case then you get a three times a five, times a seven, uh, multiplying all those together, you should get 105 times one plus X to the negative nine halves. Now this function um, is a decreasing function uh, on the interval in question here. And therefore the biggest that this can get in terms of absolute value will happen at the left endpoint. And so that's gonna happen at the point x equals negative 0.1, right? So, so our d value from before that, it, that we had this d value, we're taking the absolute value of negative 0.1. Uh, so how far, how far can x, how big can this derivative get as x ranges between negative 0.1 and 0.1? Well, because the function that this derivative here is decreasing, because it's decreasing, the biggest is gonna happen on the left at this negative 0.1. So we wanna insert that into this expression right here. And so when we do that, m needs to be greater than or equal to 105 over 32. And then when you plug in the negative 0.1, you're gonna get this 0.9 to the, to the negative nine halves power like so. And so again, um, this thing, would look like 105 over 32 times the square root of 0.9 to the negative nine. So I'm actually gonna put it in the denominator. And that's gonna be raised to the ninth power. So we have somewhat of an issue right here, right? Because if we can compute the square root of 0.9, why are we doing this whole exercise, right? So we're gonna have to think of a sort of a clever way of getting around this situation. And so what I'm gonna offer is the following. This right here is gonna be less than 105, 105 over 32 times the square root of 0.81 to 
for the ninth. Why is that a good choice? Well, because point uh, if you make the if you make the de if you make the number 0.9 get smaller, that actually makes the fraction get bigger. And now 0.81 is actually a perfect square. And so this thing becomes 105 over 32 times. We're going to get 0.9 again to the ninth. And so taking something to the ninth power, although it can be kind of difficult, uh, just use a calculator. This is just basic multiplication there. We're going to end up with 105 time, uh, divided by 32, 32 times 0.9 to the ninth. Uh, you end up with 0 0.387420489. That's going to be even more difficult arithmetic here. I'm going to going to say that this is less than 105 over 32 times 0.3. That is this number right here. I'm just going to replace it with something even smaller, 0.3. Voila. And then that cleans up very dramatically. Uh, you're going to end up with, with 175 over 16. So again, these are error bounds. These are inequalities, right? You can sometimes fudge the numbers a little bit to make life easier for you. So 175 over 16 is a much better value to use. And that way it doesn't actually require any sort of the reason. We don't actually have to compute a number that we haven't computed yet. So going back to our error, the error, which is equal to the remainder sub four of X right here, uh, this is going to be bounded above by 175 over 16 uh, divided by 5 factorial, which is 120, like we saw before. And then you're going to take the you're going to take a 0.1 here because that's as far away from the center as we're getting, and we're going to raise this to the fifth power. All right, a little bit tedious at this moment. The arithmetic might be, but as it just requires addition, multiplication, division really just division and multiplication right here. These are our four functions of arithmetic. Well, two of those functions. This will be approximately 9.115 times 10 to the negative seventh. And so we see that this answer would be accurate to about six decimal places. Uh, remember our, our calculation from before. Where is it? Aha. Here it is. And so we can actually, we can see, we can see what that will be accurate to about six decimal places, at least this much right here. And it turns out that the error we did with this calculation is a little bit better than what we estimated. The error bound tells us it's going to be about about nine times into the negative seventh. But if you if we did a slightly more accurate calculation, we can see that this is actually a six point zero four one times ten to the negative seventh. That is our error bound gave us this, but the actual error was this illustrated in green right here. And so oftentimes our estimates can do much better than the error bound gives us. So when you're approximating a, a value using a Taylor polynomial, Taylor's inequality gives you the error bound you want to use to try to calculate a uh, worst case scenario, how bad your error is going to be. And so this brings us to the end of lecture 48. And this actually brings us to the end of our lecture series calculus two here. Um, for those who stuck around for this series, uh, congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. Calculus 2 is a very, very difficult course. I'll give you that. Um, and so way to go making it to here. Now, I do want to mention that even though the series is going to be officially over in the future, it's very possible that I actually might include some new videos that are related to Calculus 2 that are sort of optional um, that students can look into if they are interested. So take a look for those things. You know, feel free to subscribe so you do get updates about those additional videos that might be added, not just for Calculus 2, but for other uh, college-level mathematics classes or questions you might have in the future. Feel free to hit the, the like button, and hopefully I'll see you for next time, right? With the end of Calculus 2, I think the very natural thing to go to next was well, we could go into differential equations. We did a little bit of those in our series. Uh, calculus 3 is another way to continue on. We saw a little bit of that when we talked about polar coordinates and parametric curves. Uh, calculus 3 is typically about finding, finding uh, working with multiple variables uh, in your calculus problems. We did a little bit of probability in this course, so st st calculus-based stat uh, statistics class kind of makes sense. Or my very favorite, uh, it would be linear algebra. In fact, we have a, the, this channel has a really good, uh, not just video lectures, but also a free digital textbook based upon linear algebra. It's known as linear algebra done openly. 
And so if you are interested in learning kind of what's the next step in these in your mathematical journeys, take a look at some of the links that hopefully you see on the screen right now. And I will hopefully see you in another another lecture series sometime soon. Um, keep on calculating, everyone. And I'll hopefully see you next time. Bye.